Hi everyone, welcome to the continuation of our discussion of critical media studies, in this video focusing on what is known as queer analysis. Let me point out first of all that this is not a pejorative term, not intended to offer any offense to anybody, it's just a term that was used to describe this theory uh, in, in historically, so uh, we've kept calling it that, so it's just known as queer analysis. So what do we mean by queer analysis? Well, queer analysis examines artifacts using a framework that considers how human understanding of gender, sex, and sexuality are affected by the media. So getting away from the strict understanding of masculine versus feminine, looking at some of the different aspects of, of uh, gender fluidity, sex, and sexuality, and how those things are affected in, by the, in the creation and the viewing of different media. Just a brief little history. Um, first of all, this is kind of an offshoot of feminist analysis. Um, so it means that it stemmed from that initially. Um, and the idea though that, uh, that queer analysis really focuses on the in-betweens, by which we mean, you know, feminist analysis uh, really focuses on masculine versus feminine, and that's it. It's very clear cut, masculine, feminine, those traditional views and roles. Queer analysis focuses on the in-betweens. It's a less binary approach than feminist criticism or feminist analysis. It takes a look at, again, gender fluidity, um, but also the idea of sexuality, um, you know, between those sexes and a, a little less traditional approach in those regards. The major premises of uh, queer analysis are, uh, again, that a binary view of sexuality is too narrow. The idea that, that a person is either heterosexual or homosexual, even that is too narrow, let alone, you know, masculine and feminine, things like that. But, but the binary view of sex is too narrow, according to queer analysis, right? That the definition of these concepts and uh, meaning, you know, heterosexual and homosexual uh, is constant. And, and the definition of sexuality is really constantly changing within a culture. Um, which also defies attempts at binary classification. So this idea that, um, first of all, again, much like we talked about with masculine and feminine being social constructs, ideas that we create to help identify and narrow down these things. Um, the fact that um, the ideas of, of heterosexual and homosexual are also um, socially defined and social constructs, right? And so queer analysis says those are too narrowing. It's not just a matter of heterosexual or homosexual. It's, you know, there's more fluidity in things than that. So um, it, it just defies that binary classification. In a contemporary sense, we uh, look here at, at, at different sexual stereotypes. Um, so uh, queer analysis attempts to break those down and, and break away from those sexual stereotypes, things like natural and deviant. The idea that one type of sexuality is natural and the other is deviant. So that if you were, you know, traditionally we would say heterosexuality is natural. It's the way that things ought to be and it's the way that nature intended things. And then if you are anything other than strictly heterosexual, that that is a deviant behavior, meaning deviating from the norm of society. Queer analysis says that's not that's not appropriate. That's too narrow a perspective. Also, things like monogamous and promiscuous, that if you are not monogamous, then you are, again, deviant. You are promiscuous, which is, it would be considered more of a deviant behavior, uh, but that there's an in-between there too, in between these things. It's not a binary classification between monogamous and promiscuous that, you know, in our culture today, we recognize things like um, I don't know how you want to define it, open relationships or, or even just uh, um, uh, relationships that involve more than two people, committed relationships that may involve three people or more, um, that, uh, that there's some room in between there. In other words, queer analysis says that it's not just a binary thing here, that there's a, not, it's not as, as straightforward between gender clarity and gender ambiguity, that there's, again, there's room in between. This is what we're talking about with queer analysis, the in-betweens of these things from so we have, um, first of all, addressing these different types of sexual um, stereotypes, right? Um, oh, sorry. Also, we look at things like positive representation. Note that positive representation, positive is in quotations there. This idea that contemporary media attempts to portray um, these different attitudes and different relationships, such as um, gay relationships and homosexual relationships and relationships that are not monogamous or, and so forth in a positive way, but does so in a way that really tries to fit them in um, a, a particular um, perspective of, um, of our traditional definitions still. Right. So, um, for example, um, we could look at the idea of this the 
television show Modern Family, which has a clear representation of a gay couple um, in a committed relationship. But we look at that relationship again, and it's still really outside of the fact that there are two men involved in that relationship. It is a pretty traditional relationship. It is monogamous. Um, it is a, a very clear on, you know, there's no questioning between them about whether or not they're uh, homosexual, um, that they're strictly attracted to other men. There's no fluidity there in terms of the, the gender clarity and the, and the gender ambiguity or the, the uh, sexual clarity and sexual ambiguity, what they might be interested in. Um, and we see as the, as the relationship continues to grow that, again, they're a very traditional family. You have kind of the one that predominantly throughout the, sh the show, one is the working, um, kind of the, the, the provider of the family. The other is more the homemaker, so to speak. They're raising um, kids together. And it, so even though it's a gay couple, it's still represented in a very traditional um, sort of manner. That's what we mean by positive representation, that, that while there's that effort there, that it may not represent really all again the in-betweens all of those things that even though we're, we're representing a, you know almost sexual relation a gay relationship in the show that it's doing so in really a very uh, in the construct of a very traditional relationship as well there's also this uh, contemporary perspective of invisibility um, that, that, that things may be there but may not be seen um, or may only be seen by particular people um, so um, you have this idea of camp what's known as camp. And camp is a collection of stylistic elements that resonate with the experiences of queer individuals living within a heteronormative social system. So, um, so again, kind of going back to this idea that, uh, that uh, they may resonate there, but they may be kind of hidden or they may be kind of um, obvious to some people, but not to others. Um, I, I think of, you know, shows, and this doesn't, this show doesn't necessarily feature uh, predominantly gay characters, but the, the show Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, if you're familiar with that, right? it, it uses a lot of stereotypes and does so um, in a way that, um, that sort of gives a nod to the traditional uh, uh, things about, you know, what's it like to have a crazy ex-girlfriend? What's the behavior like? What is And what is a show like this about? It's a musical show. So, um, but anyway, there's just a lot of stylistic elements that will stand out there, but still fits it into a more normative um, state in the, as far as what we expect from media. <clears throat> and we see that a lot with, uh, with the representation of, of, of sexuality in television as well. The other idea here is that what we call the fourth persona, or the, the textual wink um, that may be there that some people may say, okay, um, they look at this and they don't see a representation of, of you know, different sexuality or different, uh, different normative behavior, um, but it's their Nonetheless, so one representation, my, my wife is very much into uh, Animal Crossing, the video game Animal Crossing. And there's been a lot of discussion, I know, in that world, the Animal Crossing world, about the relationship between two characters, one named CJ, who's kind of the fishing guy, and the other, um, uh, Flick, I think is their name, um, the, the bug um, person, right? There's some question about whether these two are in a relationship and uh, are they, are they gay? Are they bisexual? Is one of them a woman and one of them, I mean, who not, I mean, you know, there's all kinds of questions here, but there are some people who look at this and say, I see what's happening here. You know, this is a nod. This is a wink to that culture, this idea of um, less heterosexual normative behavior, uh, but it's not outright right? Because they don't want to maybe put off people um, that, are, that, are, that don't follow those values or whatever. But so you have these things that are represented in the media as well. Some common questions that we ask in queer analysis, how is sexuality defined in the artifact? Is it a very traditional, you know, heterosexual or even heterosexual homosexual thing? Or is there some fluidity in the way that sexuality is described and used in this, in this media? What are the power relationships between the person's varying sexuality? Is, the, is it the idea that, again, as we looked at in feminist analysis, this power dynamic where heterosexual, predominantly heterosexual white, white males create this media? So are they um, represented in that way in the media as having the, being dominant in that power structure? What does the word contribute to our knowledge of queer, gay, or lesbian experience in, in history, including artistic history? So what does this add to that, that body of work, so to speak? How does the uh, artifact illustrate the problematics of sexuality and sexual identity? Is it, is it uh, what we would consider an accurate representation? There's some discussion, too, about uh, how the idea of coming out in a television show or film is always portrayed in a very dramatic way. Like it's a massive decision. and Everybody else has to kind of 
take it in and adjust. And, and is that really the way that things always happen? I mean, I'm sure it does happen that way, but is it, you know, the, the kind of way that things normally happen, or is it just that representation, that common representation? Is it, is it an accurate representation of how those things play out, you know, in a broader scope? What sort of support, if any, is given to the elements or characters who question the heterosexual, homosexual binary? And what happens to those elements or, or those characters, right? So what happens if somebody is gender fluid or if they are sexually fluid, right? And don't fall into that strictly heterosexual or homosexual binary uh, status. Uh, how are they treated? How is that situation treated? Are they looked at as odd or weird? Or is that you know, made a big deal? Or is that just kind of the norm for that um, situation in that media? And what elements of the artifact exist in the middle between the perceived heterosexual, homosexual binary? Or in other words, what elements exhibit traits of both? So, so again, um, how does this fall? Uh, or what elements fall in the middle here? Do they represent the in-betweens, so to speak? I wonder, once again, just take a quick uh, examination of an artifact here uh, with some of those questions, just give you an idea of what that looks like. Uh, I chose to do this with uh, Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist, which is a television show um, that's been on recently. It's, if you're not familiar with it, it's a it's a television show where this uh, young woman, Zoe, has an experience where now she hears music, hears see people singing and dancing to express themselves in their mind. And they're not aware that it's happening for the most part. But in particular, there's one character in the show that I wanted to focus on, and that is the character of Mo. Mo is kind of a gender fluid. Um, they, they, they In the show... Mo indicates that uh, that they go by he, but also are gender fluid enough that they would accept they, their, them, those types of pronouns as well. But uh, uh, but as we can see, you know, representation of Mo in this particular television show. So as we look at this in Zoe's extraordinary playlist, how is sexuality defined in the artifact? Well, there's a lot of you know, again heterosexual normative sexual behavior that's happening. Most of the relationships here involve um, heterosexual. You know, men and women involved in a heterosexual relationship, um, but they do have the representation of Mo in here um, as again, gender fluid, um, presumably um, homosexual, but um, but we don't know. Um, in the show, she, we only see Mo engaging with uh, other men, but uh, um, so but could be gender fluid in that way, so um, but uh, sexually fluid in that way. So sexuality is primarily defined, again, as, as heterosexual, but we do have this representation in there. What are the power relationships between the persons of varying sexuality? Well, it's interesting that Mo's not really a, 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 a she's a central character, but he or she they are a central character, uh, but not the main character. Uh, that's obviously Zoe. The show is named after her, uh, but Mo does play an important role in this program, and uh, and this gets a lot of representation there, and uh, really is represented as a sort of a powerful character in this program, right? It gives Zoe a lot of advice and is a, a kind of a force of nature and just personality there. There, Mo's a, a force of nature, very powerful. So, um, but, uh, but, and oftentimes uh, portrayed as, as sort of having vulnerability as well. So it, it is an interesting kind of combination there. What does the work contribute to our knowledge of the queer, gay, lesbian experience and history, including artistic history? Um, you know, I, I, you know, I don't know. It, it's sort of contemporary, so uh, it does contribute to the idea that you can just have this um, character in a show who is who they are, right? There's no kind of big deal made about Mo's sexuality or um, the, the the transgender nature of, of Mo's um, persona, and and it's not really something that's um, drawn out a lot. It just kind of is represented as is what it is, and people accept it. So. I mean, there's there's that. Um, I don't know that it that it really extends our knowledge of, of uh, the gay and lesbian experience outside of Mo's personal experience. Um, I don't know that it's necessarily representative of the um, the, the larger kind of uh, LGBTQ uh, experience, maybe. But uh, but it is representative of Mo's experience in this situation. How does the artifact illustrate the problematics of sexuality and sexual identity? Um, you know, I think there are situations where Mo does find that she has to explain herself, so to speak, or um, or, or take a stand for herself, himself, herself, their self. I'm struggling with my pronouns here, uh, but uh, 
so it does, I guess, but, uh, but for the most part represents just kind of a normative situation for Mona. It just kind of is what it is. It doesn't throw, I think, him or her into situations where um, they're, they're really called on to explain things or thrown into difficult situations necessarily because of uh, his, his sexuality. Uh, what sort of support, if any, is given to the elements or characters who question that? There's, again, not a lot of questioning. It just kind of is seen as kind of a normal thing. There's not a lot of questioning about, you know, well, why is Mo this way? Why is Mo behave this way? Why is Mo dressed this way? Um, it's just kind of um, is what it is. Mo's different and flamboyant and things, but uh, so there's that, but, but not necessarily questioned because of uh, their sexuality. What elements exist in the middle between the perceived heterosexual, homosexual binary? It is interesting that I think Mo is represented as um, homosexual. Uh, we don't see any instances of, of them in relationships with women uh, of a sexual nature. All the, all the, the intimate relationships that Mo has in the television program are, uh, are with other men. So we don't have that, but, uh, but there is this question of, um, or this idea of, uh, gender fluidity mo typically um, dresses and 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 uh, exhibits uh, traits of femininity and so we do have that expression here um, so uh, and, a, and a good one uh, mo's, a, mo's a great character i love the character of mo uh, in part because mo brings a lot to the show in terms of his voice just an incredible singer so that adds to it and you kind of forget the other stuff but uh and maybe that's kind of the idea here that uh, that they're saying the other stuff is just what it is. It's just the normal part. So let's focus on these other things. So I, I don't remember, but anyway, just an interesting uh, thing to consider, I guess, from that perspective. What what does this add to that uh, to that history, to that arsenal, and to the representation and uh, and normalization of these types of of choices and behaviors and, and things? So anyway. Okay, that's our look at, at queer analysis. Hopefully it's been interesting for you and, and, and opened some perspectives for you. Again, adding one more critical lens to our, uh, to our tool set, to our tool belt of critical media studies. If you have questions about queer analysis or any of the other types of critical media studies or critical media analysis that we've looked at, please feel free to email me. Uh, I'd love to hear from you uh, in that way and be able to discuss this with you further. In the meantime, I hope that you will, uh, again, gain a new perspective here, continue to look at things from the perspective of not only queer analysis, but the other critical media analysis that we've discussed.